Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Cinema Savvy. It is myself, George, joined once more by Tate and bringing back to the channel, Neil from Get Your Comic Con. Thank you so much for joining us. But first of all, how are we all doing tonight? Yeah, good. Doing good. Mm. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, we are doing a new episode. This is the Mount Rushmore series. I guess we can officially call this season of one. Uh, I was a little bit ill last week, so I didn't actually record an intro video like I normally do for new series, but this is going to be the new weekly show, which we're running up to the start of December this year, and we will be bringing back, if people enjoy it, um, multiple times potentially across next year and the future. Basically, it's a great way for us to do a, a short little series whilst we're not doing any big retrospectives, and it enables us to bring in a lot of people for a somewhat more civilised discussion than other types of videos we've done in the past. And we thought, well, episode one, introducing it for a brand new audience, let's do something personal. Nope. Um, we'll do that in episode two. We'll announce episode two at the end of this video today because Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice is out in cinemas this Friday. And we thought, let's kickstart with Tim Burton. There's been a lot of people rewatching Tim Burton films online. Beetlejuice had its premiere in Venice. It's had its premiere in the UK. Our review is going to be up tomorrow as well. In fact, the time this video goes up, Tate and Neil will be watching it in the cinema. Uh, that's how yes. prepared we have been for <laughs> this. So we are here to talk about Tim Burton films, and we each have our own Mount Rushmore of Tim Burton. Now, for those unfamiliar with the Mount Rushmore concept, you may have seen it used a lot in sport discussions online, or apparently this is a pub conversation. I did if it asked me once for wrestling. I've never had asked in a pub again, but it does qualify it. Um, and it's something that essentially it's not a ranking of here's my four favorite films. It could be your four favorite films. It's not a ranking of the four worst, the four best. It essentially represents what the Mount Rushmore represents to those Americans, Americans neither of us are. So we don't have all the historical acts. I know one of them is Abraham Lincoln. I can't tell you who the other three are. Um, but it is something where it basically represents the, the growth of, of a country or a nation, supposedly. And in this case, we're, it's going to represent the filmography of Tim Burton. So the three of us have not necessarily come together. We each have our own list of four Tim Burton films. We'll go through taking in turns one by one by one. And then at the end of the video, we will do a quick combined one where we determine a, a Tim Burton official Mount Rushmore that isn't necessarily, from our own perspective, maybe what we grew up with, maybe something we've got an attachment to. I put X-Men 3 in my X-Men 1. That didn't make the combined one. That's the best <laughs> example we can ever give. Um, but, yeah, uh, I don't really know how to segue from this. It's always weird doing new, new season starts. Um, yeah. I say, take what? If there's any feedback, comment it. That's an obvious one. Like we, we do want to hear from people. <laughs> uh, we've picked up some new subscribers recently and followers. We're now releasing clips on Instagram. So a massive thank you to any new faces. And obviously with new faces comes new video ideas to so existing audiences as well. Thank you for obviously pushing us over 3K in the last couple of months too. But yeah, your feedback on this series, videos we'd like to see. We do have a full season lined up of 13 but we do have room to replace one or two should we need to, but we have a pretty cemented list. So I'm curious to see what videos people would like to see, some of which we may have planned. Uh, and similar with Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, we tend to plan them around what is releasing over the, the coming weeks and months. And we know that there isn't necessarily a lot releasing film-wise over the next few months. So we are working on, on a few cool shows. I feel like I've butchered the intro, but <laughs> Tate, anything you want to add to Mount Rushmore? Um, no, um, other than the fact that it may not be our favourites, it may just be, like you said, things which are close to us, or things that have a certain memory with us, or maybe just a discussion point that you want to bring up, um, and we love to see what people have as their own Mount Rushmore's in the comments and everything like that, and, you know, we love your engagement, so please leave a comment below of your Mount Rushmore for Tim Burton films, and of course, if you have any suggestions as well, um, we do have a plan. Um, it will take us pretty much up to kind of Christmas time. Um, but yeah, let us know exactly what you would like to see in the series going forward. Excellent. And kind of that being said, Neil, I feel like we haven't really pulled you in yet. We've had you on videos before. We've seen many press screenings. Uh, <laughs> do you want to talk about Get Your Comic Con first rather than at the end? Because you are wearing mm. the brand new Superman logo. 
and you've got the incredible Lego Batman Animated Series I can see behind you too. But talk about the channel, because we will come to you for your Tim Burton picks, but it's kind of great to get you on something that's non-DC, saying that we'll probably be in DC very soon too. Yeah, yeah, true. And I just can't quite escape the branding, can I? Um, and I realise that is Michael Keaton's Batmobile in front of the uh, animated series Sky line. So please don't tell me off. It's just, it fits. Um, yeah, so I, uh, I'm sure people that have seen me before on this channel will probably have heard all the spiel before. Um, so I started the website Get Your Comic Con 10, 11 years ago now. We are kind of pop culture all around so film tv comic books pushing as much comic book content as we possibly can at people we're like we'll suck you in with some cool film stuff and then make you read comic books at the same time um podcast as well which i'm kind of working on where that's going at the moment we're on a little bit of a break from that but we normally release new episodes fortnightly trying to do a bit more youtube stuff trying to do tiktok stuff we're literally everywhere trying to bring people into nerdy pop culture world Lovely, and people it's should. Terrible. I feel like Bruce is terrible. It's good, and you you were at San Diego recently, which is something what? to plug. And there's a, a yeah. lot of stuff. So everyone head over to the social medias at, at Get Your Comic Con, uh, and I said you guys will be at the screening, so there'll probably be a photo of everybody. But yeah, it's uh, it is nice to talk about Tim. But I don't think he's ever been spoken about on the channel. If I'm also honest, Tate, I don't. Oh. I don't know if there was I mean, a Jumbo review. Uh, I was at my old job, so I couldn't review it. I but... feel like maybe a quiz question has come up at some stage to do with Tim Burton. I feel like we did either a Halloween-based quiz or something like horror. I can't remember, but I'm sure that we have at some point very, very, very briefly talked. We've reviewed Miss Peregrine's. Other than that, I don't know. Like, <laughs> I I haven't even seen the TV series he did. Oh, God. Uh, Wednesday. The, uh, Wednesday. Wednesday, um, yeah. And that's that's a great plug. Don't worry, Wednesday is not on the list, but we are including, you may recognize from the thumbnail, and there may be some very snobby person hey you've got a thumbnail of a film not directed by tim burton uh we are including the nightmare before christmas uh on the basis that has tim burton's written on the title and he is so heavily involved it's the yeah. one film everyone in the world doesn't realize he directed so we we have discussed mm. and allowed that in as an exception uh it's a very weird one we don't normally do this kind of thing but uh the thumbnail looks great therefore it was decided um but starting with the mountain ready to get in things, Tate, we're going to head over to you. And for people at home, we're going to rotate one-to-one. -one. So Tate will do a pick. I shall do a pick. Neil will do a pick. We'll talk about why we picked this film. Maybe its impact on us, why we think it will be on the Mount Rushmore. And then we'll do that through to the four. And then we'll do the combined one at the end, just in case people are following. Um, do you know what? I'm, I'm going to start with kind of what we were just talking about. Um, I'm not going to go in. Um, I was tempted to go in um, release order, but... You know, just kind of hearing the words Tim Burton's Nightmare Before Christmas made me think, do you know what? Let's talk about it straight away. Um, Tim Burton's Nightmare Before Christmas is my first pick on my Mount Rushmore. Um, this is easily the most watched Tim Burton film um, in my household and that I have seen. I think I genuinely cannot count the amount of times I've seen this. It's almost a yearly basis at this point. Some years I've seen it two times. I've seen it once at Halloween and once at Christmas. It is just an all-time classic. Does not age. I mean, the animation is fantastic from Henry Selleck. Um, you know, Tim Burton wrote for it. The cast is phenomenal. Danny Elfman with a speaking role and also doing, you know, the music for it. Just the vibe, the aura, everything. It's given Hot Topic a, um, a good sales base for well over um, two decades now. And you know what? Um, it will always be a classic. Whenever I think of Tim Burton... I think of this film and it's not even a Tim Burton film. It's, it's phenomenal in that sense. Um, but you know, I, I personally cannot think of another film that is more iconic when being attached to his name than a film that has his name on it. So that is why it is uh, my first pick. I think that's fair. I'm glad we kind of, got it out of the way at the beginning because mm. some people will be snobby but listen you kind of summed it up there like it epitomizes tim burton from like an outside yeah. perspective and yeah. it might make a few of, of our list as well um so i'll save off talking about anything more with it in case it does but it is they've just announced the lego set and everyone was talking about it and then it then it came out that tim burton had had creative control on the set and that's they were kicking off there was no mr is it oogie boogie uh the villain yeah. And they were saying that because of Lego licensing, they were only allowed to do X amount of characters and he wasn't one of them. 
Um, but yeah, the, the Nightmare set looks incredible. Uh, and that'll be, again, when that comes out later this year, it'll be massive. And the film has the eternal question. Is it a Christmas film? Is it a Halloween film? Uh, and we'll let other people argue that out. I saw it for the first time it's last both. year. It's both. It's I, saw, both. I saw it in between. It was, uh, mm. I just checked Letterboxd. It was November the 18th last year, slap bang between Halloween and Christmas. The cinemas <laughs> knew what they were doing. Um, if, if I do my first one, I'm going to go in with a controversial one. Uh, I, I'm not going to do this in every video, but it, it might sound like it because I did something similar in the X-Men one. Uh, I'm going to go with not necessarily the first Tim Burton film I saw, uh, I'm going to go with a Tim Burton film that probably had more of an effect on me growing up than than any others. Okay. Uh, a film that is, I think, unfairly criticised a lot online, and some people are living uh, in a decades gone memory of something else. But I'm going for Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Um, hmm. Now, the reason why I, I mentioned is a bit of a personal thing. Listen, like many, like many, not just my generation, many generations, you grew up with Roald Dahl's books. He's one of my favorite authors growing up. His books are wonderful for young people to read, teach all about life, all that sort of thing. I love Giant Chocolate Factory. And this film came out, I want to say the summer of 05, and I was nine, because I remember it was this massive ordeal. They made replica Willy Wonka bars. You could buy them. They had the cane. This film was massive when it came out, and I loved it. And when I think of a Tim Burton film, I genuinely come to this over anything else. I don't know if it's because the opening scene brings you in with the titles, the music, the chocolate. Let's let's state the obvious. Any kid's going to enjoy the opening sequence. But you really dig deep into this, and it kind of has everything that a Tim Burton film had for decades. You look at the cast, you look at the people, you look at the, the set designs. I actually think are superb in this film. And I completely get the Johnny Depp criticism, the Michael Jackson comparisons, that he's not... The, the Willy Wonka of old, he's this weird, a different version. It's got Christopher Lee in it. What's not to love? So I'm going all out with Chaya Chocolate Factory. Um, again, some people might hate it. A lot of people dislike this film. I I get why. But for me, it, it worked so well growing up. And I'll be really honest, I was gutted we didn't get a Chaya Nicolai Gas Elevator. Then you get a little bit older and you realize that Roald Dahl blocked anyone from ever doing that sequel. Um, mm. But I actually think this is not to be the whole adaptation thing, especially with Lord of the Rings out this week, but this one's nearer and dearer to the book than the original one, which Roald Dahl also hated. Um, but yeah, does anyone want to shoot me for saying that? Because I, I love this film. Yeah, I'll, I'll load up the shotgun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I I almost picked it um, as as a hate pick. I, I, oh, I don't God. like the film. <laughs> I don't like the film. Um, I watched it when I was younger, but um, I do have fond memories of it, and I told the story to Neil beforehand, but I remember having a um, a dodgy DVD of it where the audio didn't quite sync to the visual, and halfway through, it cut off like a bit of the start, and, you know, it came back around. So I don't know if that's why I have not the best memories with this film, where the film only became, you know, watchable, you know, after, you know, the entrance scene with the um, with all the kids kind of going into the factory, but everything burning down with that that's when it became watchable, which is, yeah. So I don't know if that's kind of the memory and that's that's what's doing it, but I was never a fan of it. But I completely understand because, you know, we grew up at the same time and that was absolutely yeah. a generational thing of that was there at the time, you know, so I, I completely understand it. Great songs, though. Great songs. Yeah. Mm. Even the the terrifying burning chocolate bike things before the factory – it's catchy. It's playing in my yeah. head as we speak. And yeah. I, I love the score. And the thing is, there's going to be so many great Danny Elfman, Tim Burton you know, films with one another, but it feels like in the noughties, there was a very distinct Tim Burton style, like not to get into like the auteur filmmaking type thing, but this was one of them, like, you know, this is a Tim Burton film straight away. First 30 seconds and nothing's really happened. And uh, again, I get why some people are going to dislike it, but it's kind of made my list. It probably wouldn't make many other people's, but yeah, I still love the seventies one, and you know what? I keep forgetting there was one last year, and I also kind of like that too. Bar Timothy mm. Chalamet singing, um, he was very good at everything else. The auto tune was not so good, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Uh, segueing over to, to Neil for your first one. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna bring us back, and I'm gonna say Nightmare Before Christmas as well. So I'm gonna I'm gonna spit it out there as my first one, just so that it's we we cleared the table of. Uh, Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas. Um, 
agreeing with what Tate said, I think it's amazing how synonymous that film is with him. And it is so, you know, so many people will say that as the first thing that comes to mind when you mention Tim Burton. And I think that's just down to the fact that somehow it is, although it's Henry Selleck, who is just outstanding, it is like the entire inner workings of Tim Burton's mind somehow distilled into stop motion animation. I mean, the design work, the the whole story of it, everything is just pure him. And it's it's funny when you do tell someone for the first time that it's it wasn't directed by him and he didn't make it. You can just see people being like, what? Like, pfft. it's crazy. But also, um, and obviously this isn't necessarily a Tim Burton thing, but um, Danny Elfman's score is just, and songs and singing is just incredible. I've been lucky enough to hear him sing songs from it three or four times now live. And it's just, it's so like chills every single time. But music from this was played at my wedding as well, which will come up a couple of times as I go through my um, my list. But my wedding was Tim Burton themed. Um, so thanks for inviting me on this episode. Uh, <laughs> so like our wedding invite was the spiral, all of the music that played during the ceremony. And as we were kind of doing photos and stuff was Danny Elfman music from Tim Burton films. And so that one for me, just some of the music from that is just why I had to be on my list. That's incredible. Great. Uh, mm-hmm. I'd love to see. If you're, if you're ever boss, send me a photo of an invite if you've got any, because I'd love oh, to see them. I yeah. mean, everything. All the tables were different Tim Burton movies. So the top table was The Nightmare Before Christmas. Um, like the centerpieces were these crazy wonky top hats with like black twigs that were all covered in spider webs and purple leaves. And everyone's gift boxes were black and purple striped, like boxes with cupcakes in. And yeah. Even the even the wedding cake was like a jaunty angled purple and black cake because it was just Tim Burton all the way. Amazing, that's phenomenal. Yes, we got purple. I'm glad we got purple in the thumbnail. I tried the black and white spiral, but it just didn't work with the uh, the mountain at the front. Um, but yeah, a lot of testing. But let's um, let's head on to the second ones. Tate, do you want to go next? Yes. I feel like we might have some more overlaps coming up. I'm not going to lie. So so my second one, um, I was debating um, between one of two films here, but realistically, I went with. I had I could only pick really one of them. Um, I'm talking, of course, of the two Batman films that um, Tim Burton did. Um, I went with Batman '89. I went with the first one, and I think the reason why I picked this one is because this was my first experience of watching Batman on the screen. So this was the first Batman film I'd ever watched. I'd seen Spider-Man um, 2002, and like I'd, I'd seen the Spider-Man films first, but this was my first time watching Batman, and even though this isn't like, sorry, Keaton, you're not my Batman. And, you know, the older Batmans, even the Schumacher ones, they're, they're not my Batman films. My Batman films, you know, came a bit later um, with Christopher Nolan. But for me, I have distinct memories of watching kind of this Batman in this really kind of creepy city that, you know, was seedy, but also kind of had a bit of flair to it. And, you know, seeing Jack Nicholson as the Joker, I have distinct memories of kind of watching his performance for the first time. So even though I think I prefer the second film that he did with Batman, this film sticks in my mind a lot more. I feel like I've got more memories of this and watching it for the first time. So that's that's why I picked Batman 89. It's okay. so many people's first experience of Batman. It was mine. Um mm quite a lot longer before probably either of you guys. Um, I wasn't old enough to see it at the cinema. I'm just going to point that out because it was a 15 in the UK back then. Um, and I was only four. Um, so I didn't see it till it came out on VHS, but having already kind of been like obsessed with watching reruns of Adam West to then see Keaton's Batman for the first time, um, like that opening first scene where he swoops down in the background while the two goons are on the rooftop. I was just like, yeah, fan for life. Incredible film. I'm, I'm going to jump in with my number two just to join in the Batman conversation because I too have Batman 89. Um, mm-hmm. the, the reason with this, I'm kind of in a, a weird similar boat. Say, I think when you look at Tim Burton's career, and this sounds a bit sort of what we can do later, but there's no denying the importance of Batman. And I think mm-hmm. to Tim Burton's credit, you look even before Batman came out, you looked at everybody mocking uh, Michael Keaton being cast in the film and it was this... Tim Burton guy, he'd done Pee Wee's Big Adventure. He'd done Beatles, and now he's doing Batman. And the film was, you know, I, I guess our generation and the modern day lot that live in box office, box office, box office don't realise that this was 
one of the biggest films ever made in history in 1989. Yeah. And it nailed all the merchandising, even with this more adult theme. So you've got all this going for it, but kind of where I'm jumping with it, that I was a very much a latecomer to this. I I knew Josh Schumacher's Batman growing up. I knew Adam West Batman growing up. I obviously had Christian Bale's Batman. And I didn't see this until after The Dark Knight came out. I distinctly remember we had a... was called the Batman Anthology still box, isn't it? We had them all on DVD. And I'd never watched the first two. I'd always watched the third and fourth. And it wasn't the age rating. We were allowed to watch 15s. I just didn't like the look of it based off the back of the cover, which was kind of really dumb growing up, if you really think about it. Um, literally, don't judge a book by its cover. A uh, rare, rare DVD cover I have to add to this one. And the first time I watched it, you know, I was the right age. I was 12. I'm sure you didn't, I've enjoyed it any age, but post Dark Knight, you'd very much be wanting to watch this film first compared to, say, a Joel Schumacher Batman if you're trying mm. to experience it a bit more. And it's kind of stuck with me ever since. You look at the character of the Joker, you look at Jack Nicholson, there's ample of crate joker performances not looking at you Jared Leto um and it's one of them where you can see he made it his own some will say he's paying himself but it worked with Tim Burton the combination the 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 comedy stuff that goes with it that twisted dark sense of humor you really can't appreciate that it was Tim Burton doing this until you're older and then you realize how young he was when he made this film too that it wasn't a very obvious choice to do a Batman film. And it's a film I've probably watched the most of, of, of all of Tim Burton's, if I'm really honest. I've gone back to this film a lot over the years. I very much enjoy it. You look at the careers it launched, and uh, it, this sits on my four. I, I'm going to be honest, I, I haven't put Returns in, although you could have that Returns is the most Tim burton of his two Batman mm. films. And I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of this, uh, and I think it has to, to, to make my Mount Rushmore. So, I will go Batman Returns. Uh, <laughs> Batman 89 is not on my list because I decided I didn't want to have both of them on there and just be the Batman guy that is wearing a Superman shirt, but is <laughs> known as the Batman guy. Um, so, the reason I picked this one is because this is the... As much as the more Batman of the two is clearly 89, this is a villain's movie, um, I just love everything about it. It's such a Tim Burton gothic fairy tale melodrama of just it's in a way if you were to really look at it and be rational it's probably too busy too loud and just too kind of in your face because there's so much going on but it's just again it's like pure tim burton just distilled into film through batman so you know crazy complete gothic catwoman that's probably some fetish person's dream crazy grotesque version of the penguin that's so far away from Burgess Meredith from the 60s that was what people thought of as the penguin back then and again Danny Elfman's school and I always say the same thing which is don't ever sit next to me when you're watching Batman Returns because I will hum and sing the entire of the score all the way through the film from start to finish Excellent. I'm, I'm glad we've got the Batman's I mean with Returns I've not rewatched it as many as times as others but it really does look at the Tim Burton side and kind of where, where I'm trying to sort of say my thoughts aloud. You look at them, what happened with Forever and yeah. Batman and Robin, and it was Warner Brothers like, no, no, we've got to sort of take the Tim Burton out of this. And at the same time, without turning this into a DC debate, Josh Schumacher's got his very his own stamp on Batman. Yes, it was more for kids, but yeah. Returns, I think, I don't want to call it underrated, but I'm glad it's also on this because you are right. Like, you, you mm. kind of want to put both on because they're so similar yeah. to one another, but especially like you look at Tim Burton's run in the 90s as well of his films, uh, and it's quite incredible. And going back to Batman, I guess that's what gave him the oh, look, it's the director of Batman who wants to do this type of film. And yeah. we've seen that with Christopher Nolan, the director of Batman now wants to do this film. And credit where credit's due that Warner Brothers got it right, uh, yeah. ultimately. And I'll go with it one step further. I also think they got it right with uh, with the third and fourth one. I really, I get why teenagers and adults hated them. But listen, it worked as kids' films. A whole generation got back into Batman, just like they all did in the 60s watching uh, the original cartoonish one. So... Yeah. Is that the push and pull between making like a an adult film or making something that sells toys? And you can just feel that like that was the the kind of trade off. There was we want to we want to sell more toys, which means making a more colourful movie. Mm. Yeah, and I think it worked. And, and I guess it's the beauty of the Batman character, right? That he yeah. can have different versions. Whereas I don't think you can do that. I'm like, don't want to get into a comic thing, but look at Spider Man, who's Batman and Spider Man to me, the two biggest characters in comic history, and 
I don't think you could just change Spider-Man the way you can change Batman. And yeah. I think that's why Batman's always going to have an audience no matter what. Uh, I know we've got the Penguin series out in a few weeks. Look at that, a Batman spinoff, also Penguin. So lots of uh, exciting things happening. It's really, but... really good, but I can't talk about it. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed we'll be able to talk about it soon. Tate, your, yes. third, chip, your third pick. My third pick, um, uh, time-wise, is straight after Batman Returns. I mean, I guess you've got Nightmare in between the two, which did catch me off guard. I... I didn't realise that Nightmare was that early on in the 90s. I thought in my head it was later on in the 90s. Um, But I'm going straight after Batman Returns and going straight into Ed Wood, which I think is possibly one of his most mature films. And if there's ever a film that Tim Burton's gone and made and you look at it and you go, "This this is kind of the film that feels like it was made for the Oscars. Mm. It yeah. was this one. And it ended up winning two Oscars, didn't it? I think like, so. I can't remember what it won at the Oscars, but I distinctly remember it won for two things. Let me have a look. It won for Martin Landau, um, Best Supporting Actor, and it won for Best Makeup. Um, but I I love Edward. I really do. It's such an enticing story, you know, ripped from real life about the worst director ever. And yet it's fantastic. You really root for the guy. And, you know, Johnny Depp, I think, is is one of his most kind of, not magical performances, one of his most kind of enigmatic performances. He really does mm-hmm. kind of like light up the screen with every single scene that he's in and bring all of the characters forwards, all of the acting performances forward, just because of how kind of, you know, how kooky and how kind of, you know, driven he is to, you know, realize his dreams and, you know, he's learning the industry and he's going for all those things. And it's just fantastic um, how it's presented throughout the entire thing. Um, It's got a phenomenal cast as well. Yeah. Like probably one of his best casts that he's ever had. Um, Looking down the list of like Johnny Depp, Martin Landau, Sarah Jessica Parker, Patricia Arquette, Jeffrey Jones, Vincent D'Onofrio, Bill Murray, uh, Mike Starr. It's just stacked it's so stacked and so well put together and as a person who's seen plan nine and actually watched the film and sat down and gone through it and then seen this film it's magical it's it's kind of what the disaster artist was you know for the previous kind of generation as kind of the insight into how to make a terrible film but how things can go so wrong with good intentions um, I, I really, really do love Edward. Um, and, you know, going into this video, I was like, oh, I want to watch it again because it's going to be on my list. I, w- I do want to watch it again. And I was so happy to find out that it was on Disney Plus. So go go and watch it, you know, if you haven't. And yeah, it is. So um, go and watch it if you haven't and, you know, rewatch it if you want to as well. Yeah, I noticed it's on Disney. They've got a good... Uh not restoration of it. They've, I think they've got like a 4K cut, so it's been very upstate and it was very good on there. And there's a few Tim Burton films on there. I know he's just spoke about Disney on his Beetlejuice 2 press tour. Uh, nothing flattering to say about those. I won't recommend Dumbo, but it. if I go into my third pick, I am... I know my timelines are all over the place. I'm getting further back to what I've already done. I'm picking Beetlejuice. No, it's not just because Beetlejuice 2 is out and this video is for that. I watched this for the first time last year, and it was one of those Tim Burton films that, not like, oh, I hadn't ticked it off, but it was. I was going for a patch, like, I need to just watch more, not like classics, but I've got a load of films I own I've not seen. I want to see more from directors I like that I've not necessarily seen some of their biggest work, and Beetlejuice was one of those ones that pops for, for Tim Burton, and I loved it. I did not know what to expect. I think I was most shocked that Beetlejuice isn't actually in it for that long. 17. Um, 17 mm-hmm. plus the hour. And I was like, wow, this really isn't a story about Beetlejuice, is it? And I think, I guess, you look at the marketing, you look at Halloween costumes, you look at everything. It's fair to presume why I thought he would be, but yeah. I actually had a blast with it. I, I thought it got the delicacy of not necessarily horror, but the comedy side of things, the drama side of things, like you really dive into the meaning of that film and, and what it is about and the grief. And you're sort of thought, wow, like he did this for his, like checks out his second ever film after Pee Wee Herman's. And you can see why he would then go on to have the career he did. But you know, you, you look at those segments with the puppets and the, the crossing of that into the real life stuff. I thought it was an incredible showcase of showcase of him as a director working within his means and 
I have this right up there with his other films in terms of that Tim Burton look, the Tim Burton type film. I don't think I could do this list without it. And as we mentioned, the cast with Edward as well, you look at what these guys have gone to do. And obviously Michael Keaton spoke about Batman already, but there's a reason he kept, you know, I'm going to cast you into my next film. And without slagging off modern day audiences, it's kind of that people were outraged in the eighties. And back then you didn't just tweet abuse. You had to actually write letters, which they all did. Yeah. Um, which is more insane. And uh, at my old job, when I was based at Pinewood, a, a lot of the walls are behind the scenes photos from films that are shot there. And there were so many of Tim Burton and Michael Keaton. It was such a big thing for them to, to have them work. That obviously that was on Batman, but yeah. it was one of them where I really enjoyed Beetlejuice and without plugging the sequel too much, I'm looking forward to this. I'm glad I saw it a long time ago, like a year and a half ago, not watched it for the first time this week to catch up on the hype. And I, I think the film's very good and, it was really right up there and it's knocked a couple off when I was looking at this sister four. I was like, wow, like I'm really putting Beetlejuice up there having seen it once, but it's, it's hard to see how this hasn't really pushed him forward. And I think it's a film I keep going back to as time goes by. It's such an incredible example of practical filmmaking. And that's mm-hmm. why I'm glad that they were very clear that they wouldn't make a sequel without being allowed to do that again. Yeah. Because I wouldn't like to see this with, all CGI effects Um, because I feel like that's where he had a bit of an awkward spot maybe in the sort of noughties where studios were doing less practical stuff and pushing towards more VFX and I feel like some of his identity gets lost in some of those films where it's more visual effects heavy Um, but but, yeah, magical I think the first time I saw Beetlejuice I must have been only have been sort of four or five and I was just like bug-eyed being like this is so cool like people get to make this and this yeah, amazing. Love every frame of it. I have a slightly different opinion on Beetlejuice. <laughs> um, so uh-huh. I, I'd, I'd thought I'd not seen it before, and I went into this week going, I need to watch it because the film's coming out. As soon as it started, I started recognizing every single scene. So I think yeah. I had seen it before. Um, I, I, I understand and I can appreciate how well put together it is, but it's just not my vibe and not my film. Um, but I do look at it and go, yep, that's a Tim Burton film. Yeah. And that's that's kind of all you need to do. Um, Tim Burton's one of those directors a bit like um, Wes Anderson, where, you know, you could very easily tell who directed the film just by looking at a couple of frames of it. And Beetlejuice is one of those where, you know, you get that vibe all the way through. So, you know, I, yeah, not my vibe, but I completely understand, you know, it being, you know, a solid pick for it. Is it my go again? <laughs> Neil's third choice. Neil's go. Yeah. Yes. So, okay, um, this is where I did, was going to make a decision on the spot. So, Edward was very nearly on my list as well, but you've covered it so well that I'm going to not put that one on my list. Um, but it is a wonderful, wonderful film. And I am going to go Mars Attacks. Because oh. this is a film that I have just always loved since the first time I saw it. It is still very Tim Burton, but it is different for him um i love the fact that he was adapting literally a trading card and making an entire world out of it and it's just so bonkers and his aesthetic works really well with the the kind of world that he creates and there's there's a lot of satire in there which you don't get in every film of his in maybe the same way that you do in this um again stacked cast jack nicholson pierce brosnan sarah jessica parker annette benning glenn close danny devito martin short michael j fox tom jones natalie portman as a teenager before she was ever amadala um oh, lisa marie yeah it's just it's a crazy cast and it's another one of those examples where you can tell that everyone in that film wanted to work with tim burton and loved every second of working with him people go out of their comfort zones they do really different things than you would expect them to do they're not playing typical characters for who they are and they're the name that they are in hollywood and it just all works so well and yeah love it and although actually funnily enough having just sort of criticized some of his more visual effects heavy ones this is one where it works there's a good mix of practical and, and visual effects in this and it actually works quite well i've not seen it I've Never seen clips fight. of it. I, I, all I knew was that t- uh, Piers Brosnan was in it, and I've seen a clip from a court. Uh, but I, out of context, I have no memory. But I've heard a lot of great things about that one. 
Um, I, I would. I mean, he hasn't. There's only a few I've not seen. I think it's one of the five I've not. Mm. A lot of the other ones are more his 2010s. Yeah. Uh, don't know if anyone's got any of them, but I guess we'll, we'll find out shortly if we go into the final pick each. We go to our final pick. Before we go into my final pick, I do want to give a kind of shout out to a few that I, I did consider but didn't go for in the end. Um, Corpse Bride <laughs> was a straight swap for Nightmare Before Christmas if we weren't allowing Nightmare Before Christmas. And I absolutely adore Corpse Bride. It's yeah. just I, I have more of a connection to Nightmare with that one. And then Edward Scissorhands, because that is very much... Um, the most Tim Burton-y Tim Burton film I think there is. Um, and I'm, I may be putting that one forwards for the 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 big Mount Rushmore, even if no one has picked it, I feel like it should probably be there. Um, but my final pick ends up being probably the oddest film experience I could probably say from this year <laughs> with a film that I've only seen once and it's suddenly become my favourite Tim Burton film. And not only that, but I want to watch it again, like right now. Um, and that's Big Fish. Um, I don't think I've ever had such a kind of drastic reaction to a first time watch of a film that's come out so long ago. Um, I was just blown away by it. And I, I was I was kind of left in, in tears. Like, it's such a beautiful film. Um, visually, the music is fantastic. The storytelling behind it is brilliant. You've got Ewan McGregor on the screen for a good chunk of the film as well, which is enough to bring anyone to tears. <laughs> Um, you know, a fantastic background cast such as Albert Finney, Billy Crudup. Um, you've got your Helena Bonacarta pick, which, um, you know, there are two actors, you know, or three maybe if you throw in Keaton, who are linked in with Tim Burton, and she is one of them. Um, you've got Marion Cotillard in there. You've got, um, mm. you've, there's just so many. Danny DeVito's in there, Steve Buscemi's in there. Um, Deep Roy's in there as well, um, who people may know as um, the um, Oompa Loompa from... Um, Charlie and Chocolate Factory. It was such a magical film about, you know, storytelling, passing on a legacy, and what a father son relationship can be when coming to the end of a life. And I've been lucky enough to, you know, grow up in a family that's been quite close, and I have quite a close relationship to my dad. And I'll, I'll say that this was enough to just break me down completely because of that. Um, the ending scenes alone just completely destroyed me and everything in between was so magical, if yet so ordinary. And storytelling has always been massive with me. So this film ticked all the boxes. And I mean, I saw it for the first time this year. I will probably see it again before the end of this year. I may watch it a few times. This this could become a, a favorite of mine, um, especially after how the first watch went. Um, I can't gush over this film enough. I already did it on our um, on our uh, what we watched earlier on in the year, but uh, this one really stuck with me, so it had to go onto my list. It had to. I've, I've not seen it. It's sorry to be that guy, but mm. <laughs> uh, a friend of mine I met at Red Carpet for ironically meeting Ewan McGregor. He had a Big Fish DVD signed by everyone except Ewan McGregor, and he said he'd been to three or four Red Carpets just to get Ewan McGregor on it, and he spoke about being like his favorite film ever made. And I'd, I'd never heard of it until that day. And anyone I've met that's seen the film seems to very much enjoy it. Uh, it was one of them where I watched a couple of his films in the last week to catch up. And this was the the, the last big one I didn't get to see. Um, so it's I'm very only, curious. I mean, I know it means nothing, but it's his highest rated film on IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes. On both. I know that means nothing, but, you know, <laughs> it's, it's well regarded across the board. Yeah. It's really interesting to see how his, he almost strip away a lot of his visual style because it's a lot more straightforward and folksy, but it's how Tim Burton then does that, which still means it's very Tim Burton at the same time. It's like, it's weirdly Burton and not at the same time, but it's a really beautiful story. Recommend it. <laughs> I, I will try and see it. I also want to see because I love you and McGregor, and I don't know Marion Cotillard in it, which is also great, great mm. to hear. Um, mm. I'm going to go with my number four pick. Feel a bit bad now. Everyone's already spoke like this. Uh, I, I've put Nightmare on, and I, the hey. reason I'm putting it on last is because <laughs> I'd seen this. I say late. I saw it last year, um, last November. I saw it at the cinema. This was on a day. I don't even remember on a videotape. 
I watched five films in a singular day, not all at the cinema. I remember you talking uh, about it. Yeah. I I was meant to do a triple bill, I think, at the cinema of Nightmare, Hunger Games, well, uh, the 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 the, the, oh, the yeah, song yeah. Snakes, and and the third one after, and I can't remember what the third one was, but I didn't go and watch it. I then went home after Hunger Games and basically rewatched all four films across like the next twelve hours. So Nightmare was in the back of my mind, and I loved it. I'm not entirely big on Christmas films, a bit hypocritical when we now do a Christmas series each year. Uh, and I'm also not big on Halloween. So the concept of a Halloween slash Christmas film was something <laughs> I'd always been like, okay, I can avoid that one. But the music is endeared by so many. I've seen so many, not adverts for, for the tour, but I know that it is always Danny Elfman doing it himself and he does yeah. tour around himself. I've seen Billy Eilish doing it with him. Yeah. It's a massive do when it goes live and I was always curious by the soundtrack side that okay if maybe this isn't going to be for me story-wise time-wise but I'd like to see this film because I've heard so much about it it's on at a cinema it's not December it's not October so hopefully it's empty there were three people uh so I nailed that part right and it was like one hour 15 minutes it was almost a short film and I really enjoyed it I did not know what to expect again I, I didn't know the songs I'd known the images but I, I really enjoyed it. And it was actually a lot more adult than I thought it would be. I thought it'd be some, you know, kiddie Halloween type thing. But there's some really gruesome stuff in this. And I, I thought it was great. And it's kind of where we spoke with this, that we're letting it on this list. And although Tim Burton didn't direct it, it's what you mentioned earlier. It's, it's his imagination that's been brought yeah. to life. And really, if you put so many of his films together, this might be the one where if you put everyone in a room, just point into a shot, say, which is a Tim Burton film, they'd all probably That's go to this is. over anything else, which yeah. is that like crazy irony. I know that, I don't know if his exhibition started in London yet, but there was going to be like an art exhibition mm. more than like a prop and costume thing. And it's uh, it's really interesting to see this film and obviously his attachment to it over the decades, Danny Elfman's too. And I, I think it's rightfully on this list and I can't imagine not putting it on this list. I know sort of three of my picks are quite early on in his career, but it, I can't drop it from my mind. I almost did put Sweeney Todd on, and I know that is very mixed with people. Yeah. Um, but kind of what you mentioned there, Tate, you look at the, the big hitters that have been with him in his career, in his films, and Sweeney Todd, this is maybe a terrible comparison, felt like the Avengers Endgame for Tim Burton, that just at this point in life, every single person that was involved in it, the setting, the musical stuff, it was like you knew it was a Tim Burton film without knowing who Tim Burton was. And I remember seeing it, I didn't even know it was a musical, and I don't like musicals at this point in my life. And I was like, oh, they're singing. But someone got chucked into another one, and I was like, wow. Um, <laughs> so it, it's, it was almost Sweeney Todd, but it's it's not. It, I, I've, it, I've made the right choice. I know, And also Sweeney Todd and Chine Truck Factory is two years apart. It's kind of the same cast overlapping at points, and I've got to go Chine Truck Factory. But yeah, my fourth pick's Nightmare. I should have just said it first, shouldn't I? Just did a clean sweep out of my <laughs> We bookended it. Nightmare as well, which, which I, I just hope sticks unless he can convince me otherwise. I'd love that they have never gone back and made a sequel. Despite the decades of Hot Topic, which you very, very rightly pointed out, the the, the decades of emo kids wishing they were Sally, um, despite any pressure from any of us who grew up with it, who loved it, who still love it, who still go and watch it at the cinema, I love that they have never, ever cashed in and made any form of sequel. You put him in your Disney video games, Jack can appear in crossovers or whatever in your video games. Don't make a sequel unless you really, really, really have the right thing because you will ruin one of the most perfect films of, uh, I think, the entire generation. Could be say that him talking about Disney recently rules out anything else. You can imagine a post Beetlejuice 2 if it's great, the whole world's like, go on, Tim. Now let's get back to some of your early films yeah. again. Like you, I know he didn't do Adam's Family, but doing Wednesday was. Uh, I'm yeah. dipping back into something that's been done, and you are right. It, I'm surprised it hasn't been done. At the same time, I'm, I'm glad it hasn't. And yeah. I, I don't know what you could do. Don't, don't bring back Oogie Boogie Boogie. That was a pretty painful way to go. Uh, he's doing <laughs> the Lego set. Get get the Lego sets going. You know, you. I think it's the town they're doing, and the yeah, moon yeah. is an actual Lego set, which people are very excited about. But. Um, yeah, it's it's one of them where it's popularity. And I, I don't think the popularity put me off going to see it. 
I think sometimes a film pops up to be seen at the cinema and I'm like, you know, I've never seen it and I'd like to see it at a cinema. I'd concentrate yeah. better. I'd enjoy it better. I'd have a better experience. And okay, it was a Saturday morning and there was three people, but there wasn't rows of children screaming, shouting, singing. It wasn't a sing-along. It was a, whew, this is nice. This is calm. Uh, and then we'll go watch all the other films after. Yeah, I saw it at the BFI IMAX. That was the last time I saw it at the cinema. They put it on last year, um, the rest, the, the new restoration or the most recent restoration of it at BFI IMAX, and it looked amazing on that screen. So for a long time, they put it out at Christmas in 3D when the when 3D was really in a boom and they did the 3D Blu-ray of it. It would always come out every year for you to sit and put your glasses on and go and watch it. But I was never that keen on watching it in 3D because it doesn't, it, it works, but it's not amazing in 3D. But seeing it in IMAX 2D was amazing. It was like watching it for the first time. Excellent. I want to see it in cinema. <laughs> yeah. You, you pick up some of the really, really fine detail that you can easily miss, like um, Zero's nose being a pumpkin and stuff like that. Because for years, having only watched it on DVD, I didn't realise his nose was a pumpkin. I thought it was just a red orb, and then you can see the detail. And it really is. Like, there's eyes in there, there's... The facial expression is on that pumpkin on his nose, and it's like, wow, there is so much minute detail that you just don't pick up. Anyway, you probably want my fourth pick. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I will go Edward Scissorhands. Um, I think this is quintessential Tim Burton. And again, I will park aside any issues that people might have with the lead actor of the film. The film itself is just amazing it's so it's somewhere between something like nightmare before christmas and edward like it has a maturity to it but it still has that gothic fairy tale to it it's not kind of the folklore that you get with big fish it's just somewhere that's so quintessentially burton it sits into loads of different sweet spots of his costume design just bonkers it's just one of those things that it's like a how do you how did he ever just in his mind go yeah guy with scissors for for hands and come up with that but then you see his sketches of it, and it's just so intrinsically Tim Burton. And the performances are great. Again, cast, amazing. Johnny Depp, Winona Ryder, Diane West, Anthony Michael Hall, Kathy Baker, God rest his soul, Vincent Price. Even for a split second, I love anything that has Vincent Price in it. Um, and I'm going to single it out again, Danny Elfman's score. So that was music that we walked into at our wedding was the ice dance. So that is just, again, one of the all-time great pieces of film score perfect scene perfect moment such a romantic movie moment and i just it has to be it has to be in there when it comes to tim burton i don't feel like you can have tim burton without edward scissorhands being in that list somewhere i I agree with that it fits into the dark fairy tale vibe so well and it is quintessential it's it's what it didn't end up on my four but i I will say it's got to end up on the big four Mm. has to I saw it last week for the first time. Uh, wow. I was like, oh, you can't do this video without seeing Edward Scissorhands, <laughs> can you? Yeah. And, and when that's the criteria of knowing that without seeing it, 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 it was close to Sweeney Todd. It was like, there's a couple more. And yeah, I, I, I finally got around to it. I'd seen clips. I'd seen the, the, the Timothy Chamelay joke advert earlier this year. Um, yeah. But I, I didn't really know what to expect. If I'm it's, really it's, honest, because yeah. I know I know it's a film about a man with scissors and hands, but I didn't know what the extent of that was, and I actually um, I really enjoyed it. I kind of understood understood it if that makes sense. The first time, like, yeah, now I get it. Um, and yeah, I did not think you said it's it's quintessential and kind of sticking with it. If, if we head into the before we head into the combined one, let's let's go through everyone's Mount Rushmores mm-hmm. again. Uh, we'll have a, a lovely Photoshop edited to go for each of us after, which I'll be editing in post, don't worry. Um, but Tate, do you want to very quickly go through your four? Yeah, sure. So my four were The Nightmare Before Christmas, uh, Batman 89, Edward, and Big Fish. Lovely. Okay, I've gone for Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Sorry, I'm laughing. I don't mean it to be a really, really bad pick, but it really is on my list. Uh, Batman 89, Beetlejuice, and uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. Neil? And so I went for Nightmare Before Christmas, Batman Returns, uh, Mars Attacks, and Edward Scissorhands. Lovely. I mean, we've gone 50 minutes, and this has been great. And again, this is with this video series, it just lets people bring on... I didn't know anything about your wedding, so hearing these stories has been great. And this is what this show can do, is it can allow us to talk about films in a different way to how we normally do it. No ranking, no fighting. We might do some fighting in a bit, or on another video for the combined list, but... Yeah, it's. 
I like this concept. It feels a bit different. Yeah. And where we kind of go with this is a combined one. And uh, I, I mean, I'll be really Nightmare's honest. on there, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say, right? N- Nightmare made all of us. So let's um, let's yeah. slap that on as the first one. We know Nightmare Before Christmas is locked in. Um, do we feel like we... I mean, we each had a Batman film. Do we... Here's a genuine question: Do, Is it eighty nine or is it Returns? For if we're looking at a an outright a Tim Burton, Matt Rushmore, I will be really honest. I actually see it being Batman Returns, even though I I prefer mm. eighty nine and I I look at his career and I feel that Returns is more of a Tim Burton film. And this poses the great question: um, What do people think should be on that? I'm pretty neutral. I'm, I'm not gonna kick up a fuss with whatever sort of wants on i'm reasonably neutral but i will say setting up his career batman 89 true did mm. that good point so yeah. it's whether it's because like i said in my bit i prefer batman returns but i've put batman 89 there because i feel like career wise it set everything up so that's the only debate that we'd have to have i'm very neutral on it as well because my preference is batman returns but it's worth considering that yeah, I would. Neil, we'll give you the decider. Oh no! Oh god! <laughs> Picking between my favourite children. Um, I actually think probably it should, I I agree. I think it should be eighty nine because eighty nine opened so many doors, and it opened the doors for Batman Returns to exist. And it was it was kind of like a hey, if we can do this thing, then look how crazy we can go with this. So I I, I think eighty nine deserves a spot. Lovely. Okay, guys. Right, we've got the two easy ones done. Now we have to somehow. Here we go. I, I, I'll be really open. We don't have to worry about. We don't have to worry about Challenge Track Factory. <laughs> no, um, can can I throw scissor hands in there? Um, it yeah. wasn't on my list, but I, I want to say it is like the most Tim Burton Tim Burton film. I agree. Uh, kind of where I said of it, right? I hadn't seen it. I did this video, and I was like, I can't physically come on this video without having watched that film, which to me indicates that not it has to be on there, but that's its reputation of yeah. an outside perspective and watching it and what we've discussed for, for almost an hour. I'm in total agreement. Edward Scissorhands is it is in that fall. Mm. Uh, I'm okay to put that on, Neil, yourself. Are you all right with that? I mean, it was on your list as well. Okay, this is good. We are flying, guys. We are not fighting this, or shouting. This is the or... tough one. This, do we go wacky? Do we go wacky or do we or go drama. serious? Because... There's so many different ways you can go with it. Because you can I go... Think, yeah, I, I feel like the two picks here would be Beetlejuice or Ed Wood, personally. <sighs> and then, but then you've also got, like, you've got Pee Wee, which may not necessarily be a film that people jump to, but is... That was his first film. You or you even go nineteen eighty four, so before Pee Wee, and you go with the short uh, film version of Frank and Weenie, which is stop motion. No, was that stop? That wasn't stop motion. That was the live action. Sorry, that was the live action one. Yeah, the live action version, which kind of was what even made him able to do Nightmare Before Christmas because he made those shorts at Disney, and they were like, okay, this guy has a cool aesthetic here. What can we do with this? This this it is this is a really this is going to be tough. I, without naming films, in my head, I'm looking more and because oh, Tate said Edward or Beetlejuice. Um, I'd I'd love to throw Big Fish I, into the mix, but I, I know that that's no, this not going to get this it is, on there. <laughs> no, 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 no. I I I disagree. This is where I'm going. I'm I'm leaning more toward. I don't have. I said I haven't seen Big Fish, but looking at Edward, looking at Big Fish, they're almost. Not even traditional films. I mean, mm. Edward's opening titles are insane. Um, great insane. But then you strip it back, it's more of a biopic by Tim Burton. And we've seen him do dramas, just not as many, but I still think they are a forefront of his career. So I would sort of not dip out the conversation, but I'd be making a case for one of Edward or Big Fish, sort of pushing it to both of you to see what you guys think of that analogy because we've got we've got obviously nightmare which you know we we we've all categorically slap bang easy on there epitome of his work ironically not directed by him we've got edward scissorhands we've got batman it's where we think we want to go with that fourth one uh i'm i'm happy to to go for edward or, or big fish so that's hypocritical what, what, what big would fish. be really interesting is if we went with edward we would have got Batman 89, Scissorhands 90, 93 for um, Nightmare, and then 94 for Ed Wood. And Batman that Returns f- was also the debate in there, and Beetlejuice was the debate in there. So that is the that is the. That's run like four out of six. 
Yeah, that is the run that he went it's, on. Um, it's it's a Spielberg s run of four. Like you look is. at you look at that run, and it's incredible. Um, and that's not a bad thing either that we're we're looking at no, those films from that era because. That I mean, God, we're, yeah. we're, we're tricky doing this with what he's done, like what, 16, 17 films? Um, imagine doing this with Spielberg with 35. Yes, he hasn't made the list for season one, but Christ almighty, that's going to be a devastating video when the time comes. Mm. I mean, for me personally, I, I would be 50-50 between Big Fish and Edward purely because the one time I saw Big Fish, it blew me away. Whereas Edward, I've seen multiple times and I understand its importance and it, it was kind of his most successful, you know, awards wise out of all of his films. Um it it was in his kind of best run of form as well. So for me that's kind of a debate which I can't get involved in. But I feel like once again we're gonna pass this on to Neil and Neil's gonna decide for us. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm gonna say Do I say Edward because I love that film? My rational brain is saying I should say Big Fish because I think it's so Loved and deserves more love. It's a good big fish. Excellent. Big fish. big fish is in. So, looking at this, the combined Tim Burton, Mount Rushmore, we have Nightmare Before Christmas, Batman 89, Edward Scissorhands, and Big Fish. I think that's a pretty great list, if I'm honest. You, you look at his, and you look at his that's career, right? And this is, <laughs> this, is, this is the logic of the Mount Rushmore, right? Do those four sit on the top of that mountain? I think we've made the case, and the answer is yes. And this is where this series goes when we have trickier subjects such as this with someone whose work is that not only varied, but obviously that, yeah. I don't know what, I don't know what you say about Tim Burton, what imaginative, wacky, successful, endearing, addictive. Like you watch a Tim Burton film, you kind of watch a few Tim Burton films because yeah. he just has, it's the definition of auteur filmmaking. I know it's an overused term, but it is the correct term. He's always been an auteur from sort of day one and his career's really had that. And, I think it's a very good Mount Rushmore we've done without blowing smoke for that reason. That it's kind of what the series is, right? It's more of a celebration. People will of... disagree. <laughs> no, and, and that's okay. And we want to hear those people. We want to know what makes their Tim Burton Mount Rushmore and what have we missed that's obvious that we're not. Someone somewhere is screaming saying, Planet of the Apes, where are you? Uh, my my, my not sister is screaming, Wahlberg. you haven't mentioned Sleepy Hollow. Yeah. That's really classic. Or, you know, Alice in Wonderland. The 3D mm. film after Avatar. That was my first 3D film. Uh, our cinema got 3D wow. installed at March that year. Um, Mine was um, Lee voice the Dragon Two. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> but oh, yeah, I, I mean, listen, it, it's weird doing these videos because it's not as aggressive. It's more of a a lovely sure. discussion. And if, if I'm really honest, I think we've we've done a pretty good episode too. It's really episode one, isn't it? Like X Men was a glorified pilot, and thank you, Aaron, for being on that. But <laughs> now we know we'd be doing this as a series. It's quite exciting. You know, we've got more of these because it isn't. Oh, we've got to do this, this, this. It isn't. We've got to do a million things to prepare. We've got to watch ten films. I did watch a couple, um, but it's one of them where you can look at your history with things. And, and Neil, not to, I did not know anything about the marriage. Uh, I mean, I know you're married, yes, <laughs> but the, the wedding. I'm so glad I got you on for Tim Burton because you did. You mentioned Tim Burton straight away, and I was like, I oh, "Okay, like let's." I did did not know, uh, and it makes it even better. I'm not saying I needed you to text me first, saying I got married, listening to the theme, uh, <laughs> but to get this as a bonus is is excellent. Uh, and listen, I'm not going to talk about the whole series, but there are a couple of DC ones. We've got one DC series and one DC film coming out across the next month, so we yeah. do have a couple of themed episodes. I'm sure we'll have you on for at least one of those, which we'll have a chat about a little bit later. Um, but for people watching at home, we do want to hear from you. So as we said, please comment your Mount Rushmore for Tim Burton films. Episodes you're looking forward to, episodes you think we should be doing. It isn't just exclusive to films. We are looking at, at certain points, characters, directors like today, uh, maybe even TV at some points, film scores, who knows? There's a, a lot of things we're working on. We can say that the next episode, is going to be the films that made us. I know I've made a comment about it being a very personal one. It would have been a great way to kickstart the series, and we've been able to fit that in for episode, the next episode after this, and we think it was right doing Tim Burton first. I think this is a, a lot a better discussion than that. We haven't recorded that yet, but that's going to be... This is more like, look at all discussing what we know. Next week's going to be almost maybe therapy at one point, like, this is the film that got me through this. Tate's like, oh no, what's George done? Um, but yeah... <laughs> 
it's uh, it's it's how I'm segueing out of this. Neil, we mentioned you're on at Get Your Comic On. Everyone, please just follow, subscribe him on there. I know you you've still been rebuilding the YouTube with a really random Warner Brothers deletion a couple of years ago. Yeah. Very strange. Um, but you mentioned you've been to San Diego. You've got a lot of things you're working on. There's a great Alien Romulus gala reel as well, which you can check out. Um, what else have you got coming up you're allowed to talk about? I guess that's uh, So I have been watching Penguin. I have seen five of eight episodes. I can talk about that from the 12th of September. So there's going to be lots of com- stuff coming up for that. So um, make what you will of the embargo being several days before it, the first episode drops. Um, just dropped my review of Only Murders in the Building, season four, which I'm really, really enjoying. Um, if you've watched that and were a little bit disappointed with season three, season four is a big return to form. It's really, really great. I've seen most of that. I think it's just three episodes I've not seen. Other than that, pushing San Diego interviews at the moment. I got to interview lots of cool comic book creators while I was there. Um, and that content always needs a bit of extra love. So I'm pushing some comic book stuff at the moment. Lovely. And I said, everyone, please follow Neil on there. Tate, what else have we got? I mean, the video game, you're watching Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice, we'll have the review yes. out tomorrow. Um, a film I'm looking forward to. Uh, given what you said about the first night, I'm kind of excited to, to, to hear what you have to say on that. So people stick around for a review coming on there. Oh, what else have we working? We've had so much TV recently. Neil There's been Penguin. all TV. I mean, Rings of Power is starting soonish, isn't it? It's out to the day of recording. It's, it's out today. today. The first three episodes. <laughs> it's it's getting good reviews. I'll be I'll be honest. I'll probably catch it toward the end. I've been watching a lot of TV recently, and I'm I'm enjoying. This series was like, oh, I got to watch a few Tim Burton films. I got to watch films again. Um, mm. uh, not just cinema trips. I got to watch films at home. And there's a few Tim Burton ones streaming on Disney Plus for anybody curious. So do check them out. Uh, if you want to find us on our social medias, linktree.com slash cinema savvy. That will put you through to our letterboxed Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. We are using Instagram a lot more now. We'll do clips from episodes, including today. Uh, and we put them on YouTube shorts as well. So people can look at little clips here and there. But that is going to do it for this episode. Neil, thanks again for coming on. Tate, as always, I'm excited to see the future ones. We mentioned next week is going to be the films that made us. That will be going up next Tuesday, the 10th of September. So once again, thank you all for watching, for supporting us. We'll see you on the next one. Take care.